I would like to welcome you to Lecture 5 on the topic of the Green Revolution. This lecture is part of the subject Future Farming Technologies, which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology. This degree is offered at both North Melbourne Institute of TAFE and Melbourne Polytechnic. Please visit our website at www.nmit.edu.au for further information on this subject and other courses that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In this lecture we will start with an overview of the Green Revolution. We will then follow by some detail of the history of the Green Revolution. How did it come about? Across this history we will learn about the role of science, the technology um, which included the manipulation of genes, increases in our knowledge in plant nutrition, increases in our knowledge in pest and herbicide management, and increases in our knowledge in plant use efficiency. All of this technology led to yield prediction increases. There were other advantages and some disadvantages to the Green Revolution, and in this lecture we will touch on some of these. In this subject we will cover Number four, subject learning objective, that is, describe and explain the concepts in the Green Revolution and the role of technologies. In later lectures, we will concentrate on genetic engineering methodologies, genomics, and an awareness of the ethical, environmental, and social issues. But in this lecture, we will just start with an understanding of the Green Revolution. So let us start with an overview of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was based on a series of agricultural research that was conducted between 1940 through to 1970. These experiments showed that modifications to farming practices could impact on yield and seasonal yield would consistently improve. A number of initiatives were developed to transfer this knowledge to farmers. It wasn't one technology that resulted, it was a number of technologies that were brought together which, increased, which resulted in increases in productivity. This is formed mostly on a neo-colonial uh, system of agriculture. The father of the Green Revolution is mostly attributed to Norman Borlaug. He was an American agronomist who did his PhD in plant pathology and genetics. He was able to develop high yielding varieties of, of cereal grains. His work, along with others, was rewarded by the receiving of the Nobel Peace Prize, the highest accolade of scientific contribution that one can obtain. He also received a number of other medals and awards that recognised this significant contribution to both science and to agriculture. He was accredited for saving several billion people from starvation during this period. This was achieved by both selecting varieties of cereal grains that produced high yields, along with an expansion of irrigation infrastructure modernisation of management techniques, the hybrid, uh, distribution of hybridised seeds, as well as the production of new synthetic fertilisers and new pesticides to farmers. Ethylene is a hormone that can enhance leaf senescence. For example, exogenesis application of ethylene accelerates senescence. Inhibitors of ethylene retard leaf and flower senescence. Carnations in silver thiosulfate, or STS for short, is an inhibitor of ethylene action and it results in inhibition of senescence. Dr. Berlog had a hypothesis. His hypothesis was that the increasing the productivity of agriculture on the best farmland can help control deforestation by reducing the demand for new farmland. Deforestation was as much of an issue uh, then as it still is today. The theory is simple, higher yields, less farmland required, more land for forests. 
It was thus argued that high yield technologies are ultimately saving ecosystems from de destruction. One of the issues with this hypothesis is that deforestation occurs for many reasons other than just agriculture. It also requires that modern yield production can keep up with global population growth. So let us have a look at the technology. <clears throat> On the screen you will see a picture. In this picture are two types of wheat. The tall variety on the right hand side is the traditional spring wheat, Trichalium. On the left hand side is the shorter dwarf spring wheat. It was a modification of the Norwin gene which enabled this dwarfing response. So why is this so important? Well, it alters carbohydrate partitioning. What this means is it changes the reserves or where some of the reserves can go. That is, there is more energy, carbohydrates, going into the grain. You grow wheat for grain. This was tested in Mexico, India and Pakistan. And increases in yield were evidence, evidenced in all three of these countries with the introduction to the spring wheat. As you can see from the right hand side um, graph. So what we're saying is that the, this technology caused a stepwise significantly, statistically significant increase in yield. So research continued until 1965 when Paul Lorg's team were able to produce two semi-dwarf seed varieties, Loma Rosia 64 and Songara 64. These seeds were trialled in India and Pakistan. They were transported to both India and Pakistan via Mexico. In Mexico, the shipment received significant damage and on testing, this resulted in significant redu significantly reduced germination rates. Borlaug insisted that the, the sowing densities were adjusted and the first time they were grown in both India and Pakistan, the highest yield production rates were recorded for Southeast Asia. This was absolutely incredible and a, a huge step forward for both of these countries. Both of these countries committed to importing large quantities of these seeds. It's interesting, on the first years that these were tested, there was actually war breakout between Pakistan and India, and this made the logistics of testing these crops even more complicated. Dr. Burlog had a hypothesis. His hypothesis was that the increasing the productivity of agriculture on the best farmland can help control deforestation by reducing the demand for new farmland. Deforestation was as much of an issue uh, then as it still is today. The theory is simple, higher yields, less farmland required, more land for forests. It was thus argued that high yield technologies are ultimately saving ecosystems from de destruction. One of the issues with this hypothesis is that deforestation occurs for many reasons other than just agriculture. It also requires that modern yield production can keep up with global population growth. The high yields produced by Burlog's varieties had some interesting consequences. These included a shortage of various utilities that are required to take the grain to the, pro the market. They, were, they range from labour to harvest, through to the, um, the supply of the carts to haul, the threshing of the, floor, of the flour, the bags that um, the flour is stored in, trucks, rails, cars and grain storage facilities were all in a, of shortage. Some local governments were forced to close school buildings temporarily to use them for grain storage. So let us look at some detailed consequences of using these um, varieties. In Pakistan, wheat yields nearly doubled from 4.6 million tonnes in 1965 to 7.3 million tonnes in 1970. Pakistan was self-sufficient in wheat production by 1968, a first at the time. Yields were over 21 million tonnes by 2000. In India, similar trends were seen. 
yields increased from 2.3 million tonnes in 1965 to a staggering 20.1 million tonnes in 1970. India was self-sufficient in the production of all cereals. By 2000, India was harvesting a record 76.4 million tonnes of wheat. A gene map is a map that shows the descriptive representation of the structure of a single gene. On the screen we have a genetic map of the gene families which are associated with the dwarfing genes. You will see that we start with the spring wheat and then a number of changes to the genetics has resulted in this family tree. You will note Norwin 10 the gene that we first talked about. This came about after other modifications. The closer a gene is to another gene on this family tree, the closer it is genetically. Therefore, Norman 10 and Autonoma, for example, are further away genetically than Norman 10 and the variety Beaver. As I stated earlier in this talk, there was a large body of scientists that were collectively working towards the benefits that we saw from the Green Revolution. The other technology that was enabled due to this large body of research was increased understanding in plant nutrients and plant nutrition. This led to a better nutrient efficiency and therefore aided in increases in yield. There was much research done around the areas of pests and, and weeds. This led to an increased understanding in these fields, which led to the development of new pesticides and herbicides. These pesticides and herbicides were very effective and hence aided the increase in yields. And finally, there was research done in water use. And again, increased understanding led to changes in management which again helped with the increase of yields. So as you can see, it was a collective um, or, or a number of technologies that were brought together to enable such large changes. So let us talk briefly about the drivers of change which enabled the Green Revolution. In a large part, it was about feeding hungry people and food security. There were significant changes uh, during this period in how agriculture was funded. There was an emphasis on the applied research for scientists to work directly with farmers. And this enabled rapid change and most importantly, rapid uptake. Some of the advances here were not due to agricultural research, but actually were the result of novel research and scientific curiosity. This was mostly in the areas of the genetic engineering, which enabled the input of the new genes, which also contributed significantly to the increased productivity. The Green Revolution is scattered with stories of politics. Some of these politics enabled the Green Revolution to occur, but others also um, slowed it down and certainly in some countries the Green Revolution was slow in its uptake due to the politics. When we look at the Green Revolution from a security perspective we see that agriculture and its supporting industries can play a key role in food security. The breeding of new genetic stock, animals and plants have been enabled to meet modern day requirements it, food security can be broken down into increased efficiencies in photosynthesis, increases in fertigation efficiencies, greater optimization of the nutrients that we apply, increases in water use efficiency. What that means is a greater yield for every megalitre of water applied. The method of farming that resulted from the Green Revolution did result in some significant issues. There was depletion of soil and water quality on a scale that had not been seen previously in agriculture. 
there was rapid exhaustion of non-renewable resources such as oil and phosphates. This was due to the rapid increase of nutrients. There was some loss of farming practices. These tended to be specific to regions or cultivars and had been developed over time. There was long-term productive capacity loss or less sustainable farming. And lastly, biodiversity approaches to farming were replaced by monocultural type farming. This reduced diet variety and contributed to malnutrition. I'd like you to read the following resource from the conversation. Golden rice is no silver bullet. Hunger needs a political. This is written by Claire Parfit and Bill Dunn from the University of Sydney. This gives an interesting perspective on the consequences of the Green Revolution. Please read this article, make notes and insert into your lecture here. I'd like you to read the following article on the conversation, genetically modified crops shrink farmers pesticide footprint. This is an article written by Dr. Rausch and Dr. Tribe. This is essential reading for this subject. Please read the article, make notes and insert into your lecture here. So to summarise the components that we've covered in this lecture, the Green Revolution made significant improvements in yield. It really did stop people starving. These improvements were stepwise. They'd never been witnessed before. And to be honest, it's unlikely for us to see such massive improvements in the future. They were evidence-based. They were based on science and research. They were outcomes of research working closely with industry. They're examples of breeding techniques and genetics which produce traits that allowed the improvements in yield, along with other technologies such as nutrient efficiency increases, pest and disease management increases, and better understanding of water. All of this collectively led to improvements in agricultural efficiency. However, there is a downside to the Green Revolution. As it is highly intensive in resource use, it is seen or regarded as largely not a sustainable farming practices. Improvements on the Green Revolution have been made since. The learning outcomes for this lecture should enable you now to define and describe the Green Revolution you should understand the impacts that this technology has had on agriculture. And you should be able to describe the advantages and perhaps some of the disadvantages of this technology and the role of this technology in food security. This brings us to the end of this lecture.